Hello, this is Myra Brower. I am council staff and I am giving a presentation uh, on Amendment 37 to the Snapper Grouper Management Plan, which is an amendment that addresses hogfish. So for a background, there was a stock assessment for hogfish that was conducted in 2014 with data through 2012, and that was CDAR 37, so I'll be referring to the stock assessment as such throughout the presentation. Um, during the assessment, uh, right about the same time, there was evidence from genetic studies that show that hogfish in the South Atlantic belong to two separate stocks. So we have one that goes from Georgia um, through the Carolinas, and then there's another one in Florida, East Florida, and the Florida Keys. So you'll see the acronyms um, throughout as I refer to those two stocks. For the Georgia-North Carolina stock, the status of that um, uh, population is not known, and the Florida Keys East Florida stock is actually overfished and undergoing overfishing. So for the Georgia-North Carolina stock, the Council Scientific and Statistical Committee, which is the body of um, scientific advisors that provide recommendations to the Council, they reviewed the CDR assessment and did not find it adequate for managing the Georgia-North Carolina stock. And that was because the catch at age model that was used was not the appropriate modeling framework to analyze the data that were available for that stock, and so the assessment was not considered the best available science. However, the SSC did recommend um, that the assessment be used for the Florida Keys East Florida stock. So for Georgia, North Carolina, the SSC developed an approach um, that is currently part of the Council's Acceptable Biological Catch Control Rule that can be used to set the ABC for stocks that only have reliable catch information. And we call that the ORCS approach, which stands for Only Reliable Catch Stocks. So what is ORCS? ORCS is, um, involves the selection of a catch statistic, which is a, a number, a level of landings, and then there are two numbers that show you the risk of overexploitation for that particular stock, and then another number that um, shows the management risk for that, for that stock. So the SSC provides the first two numbers, the first two criteria, and then the council specifies their um, risk management level. And the council specified these risk management levels for several species that don't have stock assessments, in Amendment 29. So for hogfish, um, you show now this table that shows you that the risk of overexploitation um, for the Georgia North Carolina stock is um, moderately high, so that corresponds to a value of 1.25. The catch statistic that they selected was the highest landings between 1999 and 2007 and that value was 40,818 pounds whole weight. And then the risk tolerance that was attributed to species under a moderately high risk of overexploitation was 0.7. So if you go and multiply all those numbers together, you arrive at the recommended ABC, acceptable biological catch, for the Georgia North Carolina stock, which is 35,716 pounds whole weight. Then for the Florida stock, um, as I said previously, the SSC recommended uh, using the CDR 37 assessment, and that assessment indicated the stock is overfished and undergoing overfishing, and when that happens, the council has two years to put in a rebuilding plan. So that's what we're doing with this amendment. Amendment 37 would specify, first of all, the two stocks and would establish that boundary between the Florida Keys, East Florida stock and the West Florida stock, which is the part that the Gulf of Mexico Council manages. Um, the amendment also specifies all the biological benchmarks and fishing levels um, and accountability measures for each of the stocks. And we also have actions that look at modifying or establishing new commercial and recreational management measures for each of the two stocks. So we have quite a bit of actions, quite a, quite a bit of stuff in this amendment. So I'll go ahead and walk you through each of the actions and uh, just present some information that can help 
you understand where the council is coming from, what they're considering, and then that way folks can um, comment on the things that are being considered for this stock. So action one, as I said, would delineate the fishery management unit. Right now, hawkfish are considered a single stock under current management. As I said before, there's genetic evidence that supports uh, splitting that management unit into two. And so the council is um, going ahead and doing that. And then what we now have to do is determine the boundary that is going to separate, as I said, the East Florida, Florida Key stock from the West Florida stock. And their preferred currently is subalternative 2C, which is for a line that is just south of Cape Sable on the west coast of Florida running due west. And so here I have a map. Um, it's, it's draft, uh, but you can, you can see the red line is where that boundary would be um, established. The blue line that you see on your screen is the current inter-council inter boundary uh, between the two councils. Actions two and three, um, I've combined them on this slide because these are, you know, biological benchmarks, um, you know, levels that managers use sort of as reference points. So uh, action two establishes the MSY, the maximum sustainable yield, and action three addresses the minimum stock size threshold. And so for MSY, the council's preferred is to set it at the yield produced by fishing at MSY um, or a substitute, a proxy. Um, and those are the values that are recommended by the most recent stock assessment. So as I said, for Georgia and North Carolina, since the stock assessment does not apply to that stock, that value is unknown. And for the Florida Keys East Florida, you can see that the model produced an estimate of 0.138 for MSY, for FMSY, excuse me, and that results in a yield of 346,095 pounds whole weight. So that's your maximum sustainable yield for that stock. And then the following action looks at a MSST, which um, that is a level below which a stock is considered overfished. So then um, the preferred is to set that level at 75% of the spawning stock biomass at MSY. And on your screen you can see what those values would be. Okay, so here's where we start getting into actions that uh, are more um, relevant to uh, people that uh, use the resource. So action four establishes the catch limits uh, for the Georgia and North Carolina stock. And first of all, what currently is in place, uh, which is for the entire stock, is an ABC of 134,824 pounds. So that's for the entire South Atlantic. Right now, the ACL, the annual catch limit, is set at the same level as the optimum yield, which is the same as the acceptable biological catch. And on your screen, you can see the allocations. Uh, we have 36.69% to the commercial sector, and the recreational sector gets 63.31% of that ABC. So that's what's currently in place, and this is what's being proposed for the Georgia North Carolina stock. So here what um, had to be done because the stock is being split up, we needed to recalculate the sector allocations. And so that, that the sector allocations are calculated with um, based on landings. And so instead of using landings for the entire South Atlantic, we had to look at only landings from Georgia and the Carolinas. And then based on that, establish the allocations. And the allocations are, are done the same way. The formula that the council uses looks at 50% of the average landings between 1986 and 2008. And that's the historic time period. And then the other half comes from average landings from 2006 to 2008, which is the recent period. So that's how those allocations were calculated. Currently, the council's preferred is to set the, the annual catch limit and the optimum yield at 95% of the ABC. So the table you see on your screen shows you what those numbers would be 
the total ACL, the recreational ACL in pounds, and then the recreational ACL in numbers of fish, as well as the commercial ACL. For the recreational ACL, the council is interested in specifying it in numbers of fish because that's how those landings are tracked um, to begin with. And so to arrive at the numbers of fish, what we did is um, use the average weight of a recreationally caught hogfish from, Florida, from the Georgia North Carolina and um, Georgia North Carolina stock and then divide, you know, use that to come up with the numbers. And the number that we used for average weight for that stock was 10.6 pounds. Hogfish in the Carolinas are much larger than hogfish off of Florida. So what this means, uh, just to put in perspective, if you compare the commercial landings, the average commercial landings between 2010 and 2014, that was 20, 000, about 20,000 pounds. The proposed ACL is higher than that. The proposed ACL is 23,456 pounds. So we are not worried, the council is not too worried that there's going to be any issues there uh, with the commercial ACL being exceeded and there being an in-season closure. So it doesn't look like any commercial, um, no reduction in commercial harvest uh, would be needed. And then for the recreational sector, the average recreational landings from, again, from 2010 through 2014 was, is 545 fish and the proposed ACL is 988 fish. So again, um, there is sufficient buffer there. Um, so there's no worry of an in-season closure for the recreational sector either. Action five, um, so now we're switching gears to Florida for a little bit. And this action is um, would address the rebuilding plan. As I said, this stock is considered overfished and undergoing overfishing, and so the council needs to put in a rebuilding plan. So alternatives two through five specify the criteria for that plan. So they specify a fishing rate, uh, the time frame during which the stock would be rebuilt, and the probability of rebuilding success. So rather than putting all those up in the presentation, um, uh, the council's preferred is alternative three, which looks at a rebuilding uh, that takes place over 10 years at a constant fishing mortality rate and with a probability of rebuilding success of 72.5%. What that looks like is this. So on the left-hand side, you see the year, you see um, the different alternatives and what the ABC would be under each of those. Under preferred alternative three, which is the one in bold, you see the values, and this is in pounds, for what the acceptable biological catch would be for each year of the rebuilding period, so from 2017 through 2027. Okay, so based on that preferred ABC, then, then the council needs to set the annual catch limit. And so action six looks at the the ACL for the Florida Keys East Florida stock. And then to be consistent, again, the council is looking at setting that ACL at 95% of the ABC. And the numbers for that um, are here. So you have your total ACL on the left-hand side, and then you know applying the sector allocations, um, you, you get your recreational ACL and your commercial ACL. And again, um, the allocations had to be recalculated with information just pertaining to Florida hogfish. And so the allocations um, changed to 9.6% commercial and 90.4% recreational. Okay, so you see also the recreational ACL is specified in numbers of fish. And again, what we did here um, is use the average weight of an individual fish um, and then use that to get the numbers. And that weight was 1.85 pounds. So as I said earlier, hogfish in Florida are substantially smaller um, than those in the Carolinas. And so doing the same little exercise as before, looking at average commercial landings from 2010 through 2014, um, that number is 13,900 pounds. And that uh, compared to the proposed ACL, and this would be the ACL for 2017, 
which is 3,512 pounds, um, that translates to a reduction in commercial harvest of about 75%. For the recreational sector, again looking at the average landings between 2010 and 2014, that was 121,000 fish compared to a proposed ACL of about 17, 18,000 fish, you need approximately an 85% reduction in harvest. Action 7 looks at putting in a recreational annual catch target. This is something that um, can be used um, in fisheries that don't have in-season management to prevent the ACL from being exceeded. And managers can use it, use ACTs uh, that are set below the ACLs so catches don't go above it. But the South Atlantic Council has so far not um, elected to choose ACTs to tie them to management measures, but, but they still have to specify them. And so currently the ACT for hogfish is for the entire stock, of course, and you see the value on your screen. And the ACT is calculated by multiplying the ACL by 1 minus the percent standard error. And the percent standard error is a measure of precision. So the larger the PSEs, the less precise or uncertain the data are. So usually you're going to see very large PSEs for species that are infrequently encountered in the MRIP survey. So the one that was used for hogfish um, to establish the current ACT was 29.5%. Now when you split it up between um, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida, Alternative 2 looks at establishing it for that um, Georgia, North Carolina stock. And for that one, the average PSC is quite high. Uh, so we know that the data for that, for that stock are very imprecise. And then for Florida, the average PSC is 20.5%. So because the PSC for Georgia, North Carolina is so high, and according to the formula that the council currently uses to, to establish ACTs, they would have had to use 50% of the recreational ACL. And so instead, they decided uh, to set the recreational ACT at 85% of the recreational ACL. And they went ahead and did the same thing for the Florida stock. Um, and I'm sorry, the numbers are um, in your public hear hearing document. I didn't want to put those up on the screen. Um, so moving on to action eight. Action 8 looks at minimum size limits for both sectors and for both stocks. So right now, the minimum size limit for hogfish is 12 inches fork length for both sectors in federal and state waters off of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida, and there's no minimum size in state waters of Georgia. So currently, the council is proposing to increase the minimum size limit for the Georgia and North Carolina stock, and their preferred currently is 17 inches pork length. They're looking at quite a range of alternatives, as you can see on your screen, and even one that would um, have a step-up um, increase over um, a number of years. For Florida, they are looking, again, at quite a range of alternatives, um, and their preferred currently is to set that minimum size limit at 15 inches fork length. And then here, I, I have some information on the average length. Um, of fish that are caught recreationally in Georgia and, and the Carolinas, and this is for 2012 through 2013, and the average length is 25.8 inches. And then you can see um, also on this slide a graph showing you the size distribution of landed hogfish that have been reported recreationally in the headboat survey and in MRIP, and you can see based on um, the y-axis of this graph that the numbers are quite low. So that, again, gives you an indication of how little information um, is available for this stock. And then for Florida, the average length here is 13.8 inches um, recreationally. And then you can see more of a, of a curve for that distribution um, according to MRIP. And you can see that the highest landings are at that minimum size of 12 inches. 
So here we have some projected um, recreational landings and numbers of fish and what that, trans what that percent reduction in harvest um, would be under each of these size limits. So under the current preferred at 17 inches fork length, um, the projected landing landings would be 411 fish, which translates to a 4.6% reduction in harvest. And then, and that's for the Georgia and North Carolina stock. For Florida, East Florida, at the 15 inch preferred uh, minimum size limit, that translates to a 61.3% reduction in recreational harvest. So obviously, um, hogfish in, in Florida, there's going to have to be some stricter management measures um, to rebuild that stock. Now we're switching to commercially uh, caught fish. This is the average length of commercially caught hogfish in Georgia and the Carolinas. Again, much bigger. It's 23.6 inches, and you can see the size distribution on that graph. Um, most of the hogfish landed commercially in that subregion are above 25 inches fork length. And for Florida, the size is much smaller, 15.1 inches is the average length, and then your size distribution peaks at your 12-inch um, minimum um, size limit for the commercial sector as well. And then here are the projected commercial landings, um, same sort of thing that we had, that we just saw for the recreational sector. So at the preferred minimum size limit of 17 inches for Georgia and North Carolina, that translates to only a 2% reduction in harvest, whereas for Florida, at the preferred 15-inch minimum size, we're looking at a 49% reduction in commercial harvest. The next action looks at um, commercial trip limits for both stocks. Currently, there is no trip limit. Um, anywhere in the South Atlantic for hogfish um, in federal waters. Alternative two looks at establishing a trip limit for the Georgia and North Carolina stock, and currently the council's preferred is 500 pounds. So they're looking at a range from 100 to 750 or no trip limit at all. And then for Florida, they're looking at um, 25, which is their preferred, um, to up to 200 pounds per trip. Um, another thing that um, the council would like um, comment, um, public comment on is specifying this trip limit perhaps in numbers as opposed to pounds. Um, so this table here shows you the equivalent, um, how many fish would translate to 25 pounds. So that would be eight hogfish, and that's using an average weight of 3.21 pounds, which is the, an average weight that was obtained from the stock assessment um, for commercial landings. So there's, you know, there's, I think for a red porgy, there's, um, the trip limit is, is specified in numbers of fish, so the council has done this before, but the majority of, of trip limits are specified in pounds. Um, this graph sh shows you the distribution of hogfish harvested per trip, um, and the dark bars are for North Carolina to Georgia, and the gray bars are East Florida and the Florida Keys. So you see that most of the trips are catching um, on the low end of things, although in North Carolina to Georgia, they're more spread out. You do have some trips that are catching, um, you know, 200 pounds and above. And then um, these tables here are similar to what I showed you for the recreational sector. This is um, for the trip limits and then um, the top table, Georgia, North Carolina, at the 500 pound preferred commercial tri trip limit, we're looking at a 5.8% reduction in commercial harvest for that subregion. And then for Florida Keys, for the Florida Keys and East Florida portion, at the 25 pound preferred commercial trip limit, that translates to a 43.4% reduction in commercial harvest. Action 10 looks at um, bag limits for the recreational sector for both stocks. Right now, the bag limit is five fish per person per day off of Florida, and there's no bag limit off of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia in federal waters. Um, alternative two 
looks at modifying the recreational bag limit for the Georgia North Carolina stock, and the preferred is to put that at two fish per person per day. And for Florida, alternative three, um, their preferred is to diminish that bag limit to one fish per person per day. And they're even considering a one fish per vessel per day. So same sort of thing. Here's the projected recreational landings and numbers of fish and what that would mean as far as percent reduction in harvest. And for the two fish per person preferred for Georgia and North Carolina, there, that translates to no reduction in harvest. And um, for Florida and the Florida Keys, the one fish per person per day preferred would mean a 44% um, reduction. So you can see how this is um, a little complicated because each different management measure um, produces a different percent reduction in harvest, and so you kind of have to look at all of these together. So it's, um, we hope to have an analysis for the council that is going to look at the combined effects of all of these various management um, alternatives. Okay, um, Action 11 looks at a recreational season, uh, and this is just for the Florida Keys East Florida stock. There is, of course, no recreational season currently. The fishing year is um, the calendar year. And then they, they're looking um, under preferred alternative two to establish a recreational season in, um, for the Florida, so Florida Keys, East Florida. And then um, their preferred is to make that season July through September. And here you can see what the landings look like um, by by month, by two month wave according to the um, MRIP survey. And you can see that the average, which is the, the red line, the landings are going to be peak in July, August. Um, so, uh, and as far as um, never mind, that's just the um, distribution of landings. Um, that we have right now. And again, there's going to be further analyses that need to be done to determine what what a season would do for the reduction that's needed to get to the fishing level that would produce um, rebuilding for this stock. And then finally, Action 12. Um, this is an action that looks at establishing accountability measures. Currently, there are accountability, accountability measures in place for hogfish but they apply to the entire South Atlantic. And so the council needs to take action to make those applicable to each of the two stocks. So there is an amendment that is about to be um, finalized or, or uh, implemented, I should say, that included AM's accountability measures um, for, for several snapper grouper species to make them consistent across the board. And so this amendment proposes the same suite of alternatives that the council um, already adopted in Amendment 34. And then um, at the December meeting, they did add a new alternative, Alternative 5, which would trigger accountability measures for the recreational sector if landings exceed the recreational ACL for two consecutive years. So it's a little bit more of a another option that is less conservative than uh, what they had in front of them in Amendment 34. So um, the timing for this amendment, in, um, as I said, in December, the council discussed it. They selected all the preferreds that I just presented to you, and they approved it for public hearings. We're going to have public hearings in January. We also have a question and answer webinar that is scheduled for January the 21st at 6 o'clock. And that will be a time when folks can ask questions, and if they're confused about something, uh, I can clarify that. I will be presenting that webinar. And then we'll have in-person hearings um, for the two weeks after that uh, throughout the South Atlantic. The council is going to review those public hearing comments and make whatever changes need to be made based on public comment at their March uh, meeting. And then in June, they're going to approve this for final review. Uh, because there's a rebuilding plan that needs to be put in place, there is what's called a statutory deadline. Um, as I said in the beginning of the presentation, the council has only two years from when they receive notification of 
the need for a rebuilding plan when a stock is overfished. And so uh, regulations need to be in place um, by early 2017. So we're looking at submitting this amendment to the National Marine Fishery Service for approval sometime in late summer or early fall 2016. So um, what the council needs is to get comments from the public on their preferred, should they change them, should they keep them, um, are there other things that they should be considering. So you can comment by mailing um, written comments. There's an address on the website and on the public hearing document. You can fax them in. You can email um, Mike Collins at sfmc.net with the subject line AM37, and the council is receiving comments until 5 p.m. on February 10th, 2016. Of course, folks can always come to the meetings and um, give their comments then. If you have questions, you can call me directly. My name is Myra, and you can um, also send me an email. And for now, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>